Now, this is a bird you'll get lots of here in the Park City area. Uh, they, they, right now, they've just finished their migration along the west coast up to the Arctic tundra where they nest. And they'll come through the Intermountain West and about mid-July they'll start arriving here. And they'll spend the balance of the summer here replenishing their fat reserves before they push on to the last leg of their migration. And hummingbirds are, I mean, all birds are incredible, but hummingbirds especially so. They, um, the, the male and the female, the parent birds, they will, I mean, imagine this. Imagine you were born this year, you're a hummingbird, you were born this year. Things seem to be pretty good. But then one day, mom and dad leave, and you never see them again. So about two weeks after that period of time, you start get the hanking uh, to take off yourself somewhere. And usually it's the photo day that generates the urge of migration. So as the days start getting shorter, um, he will one day take off at night, and he'll fly all night long. And they fly at night because the cool air is easier to fly through, and predators are less likely to snap you up. And you can see the stars and navigate by the stars. And he will migrate to the exact same parent, parent spot where they end up and spend the winter. And he's never been on a migration ever before. No one shows him how to do it. He's very hardwired and, and, and just does it. It's a remarkable thing. <coughs> now, saying how crazy that we have nesting here on the preserve, on the other hand, it's a learned behavior with them. So when they migrate, they migrate in family groups. Uh, this fall, several groups will get together and they'll form a um, flock. And, and then they will migrate with the parents during the day so you see where they're going, learn the stopover spots, and then get to their destination finally. Uh, and it will take them over some period of time. They rest, replenish their fat reserves, and then move on and so forth. And that's one of the reasons migration, I like to tell people, it's one of the reasons why it's so important to preserve places like Swana. Imagine, you know, if you're a white-faced ibis and you're flying back here for the summer and the place where you used to walk around in the meadows and feed on tadpoles and mollusk and other invertebrates, suddenly it's a, it's a housing development. You know, what do you do? How do you figure out where you're going to go as, as some of the land gets swallowed up? And um, my granddaughter, my son's daughter, who who just actually just turned 22, it's hard to imagine. Um, when she was in fourth grade, she came to me once and asked me what loss of habitat meant. She had a homework assignment. So I said, well, let's, let's go look and I'll show you some examples. We'll see if we can yeah, grab that concept. So we literally walked from my front door in Farmington down the street to where the botanical gardens used to be of USU, which had been my neighbor. And they had moved out of there and moved over by Kaysville. And that land got developed into a, a housing subdivision and a church and a church parking lot and a Smith's grocery store and so forth and so on. And I said to her, I said, Peyton, I said, remember when we used to come down here to the meadow and see the pheasants and the pheasant chicks and so forth, or the fox and the fox kids and, and so forth. And, and she said, yeah. And I said, well, where are they now? What's, what's here now? And she saw, obviously, the houses and such. And I said, well, this is what we call loss of habitat. You, know, you come home one night and your house is gone. You know, where, where do you go? So. Hummingbirds are remarkable in the, in, the, in the migration that they are able to do. They, they make the longest migration of all the birds when you figure the length of their body that they have to advance. Uh, <laughs> so uh, this is the rufous female. And you, if you put out hummingbird feeders, which I encourage you to do, uh, four parts water, one part sugar. That's, that's as simple as that. Uh, you don't want to use any red dyes, they don't metabolize the dye, their liver doesn't, so it's not good for them. Just table sugar, boil the water for about two minutes in a rolling boil, and that'll distill the water and take out any chlorine and so forth that might be present. And then turn off the heat, stir in the water and keep stirring, stirring the sugar until the sugar melts and goes in the solution. And make more than you need. Put the extra in the refrigerator so it'll be ready to go the next time you need to fill up the feeder. And then you want to fill the feeder up to where they'll consume everything that's there within three or four days. Throw away what hasn't been and then refill it. You don't have to fill it to the brim, fill it to where they are using it. So 